Well, thanks, Claire. It's always nice to have these events uh, around homecoming. We've been inviting our uh, students to come back and and teach us a little bit around this time. And it's always amazing what people are willing to do for a free football ticket. And if you think they were underpaid as research assistants, I guess uh, uh, we're paying them less now. Uh, Don Bacinius was named Executive Vice President of the Single Family Credit Guarantee Business at Freddie Mac in May of 2009, and uh, he wanted us to emphasize that that was after things got bad, and now he's supposed to be fixing it up. He oversees the sourcing, pricing, and securitization of new business, as well as the overall performance of Freddie Mac's uh, $1.8 trillion single family credit guarantee business. He first joined Freddie Mac in 1992 after serving in the Federal Housing Finance Board and the Federal Home Loan uh, Bank Board. Don received his bachelor's degree uh, at Creighton University, and he came to Iowa State, and he left with a PhD in economics and a wife, Marsha, in public administration, uh, who's in the audience here, right? So you can, um, so welcome back. Uh, he's, this was his assignment. Discuss the historic role and success of Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, and Ginny Mae in making mortgages more available and affordable before the crisis, why Freddie and Fannie ran into financial trouble during the crisis, and how the role of and restrictions on Freddie and Fannie uh, will be changing. Uh, Done. Like any good student, I recall back when I was writing uh, answers to my uh, prelims. And as a graduate student, uh, Dennis or Dudley would have written very difficult questions. As a graduate student, you usually have a hard time answering them. So the right thing to do is, if you don't know the answer to that question, answer one you do. <laughs> Which is what I'm going to do with what you did. You gave me a, a topic to speak to tonight. It sounded interesting, but I had something else I wanted to talk about. <laughs> so that is what I'm going to do. That was uh, fair game, by the way, we said. The, uh, the things I am going to cover this evening are, are really three topics. I want to talk really about what Freddie Mac has been doing to kind of support the mortgage industry during the current crisis. I want to put that into context as it relates to what Freddie Mac did for the first 40 years of its existence before it went into conservatorship. And then when I close, I want to talk just a little bit about some of the key, I think, challenges and questions we're going to face as a country as we try to rebuild the mortgage market. And I'm going to supposedly do all that in seven to ten minutes. Uh, <clears throat> that or Dan is not going to get much time to talk. <laughs> uh, a quick overview. All right? People have to recognize the mortgage market has gone through the worst housing crisis, the worst decline uh, since the Great Depression, and by some measures, worse than the Great Depression. Right? House prices are down 20 to 30 percent nationally and are down as much as 50 to 60 percent in some parts of the country. We also see that housing starts have plummeted by 75%, that one out of 10 mortgage borrower is seriously delinquent on their mortgage, and that probably as many as one out of five owe more on their mortgage than the house is worth, which you hear in the popular press referred to as being underwater on their mortgage. So we have lots of borrowers who are in trouble or are potentially going to get into trouble. Now, when you look at that context and you say, well, okay, but there's something else going on. The mortgage market today doesn't exist if not for the support of the federal government. 95% right? of all mortgages today are being originated and guaranteed by FHA, Fannie Mae, or Freddie Mac. 95% of the mortgages. There is no mortgage market in this country if not for federal government support. And one of the things we'll look at at the very end and probably one of the things we'll talk about on the panel is how do you get out of that? It's not an easy way, thing to do to extract the government from the mortgage market. During the crisis, Freddie Mac's really focused on two things. One is providing liquidity. Two is what we characterize as sustaining home ownership. Now, I want to put Freddie Mac into context because sometimes people hear the name and as a person tonight at dinner said, you know, if you didn't know about Freddie Mac three years ago, you'd never really heard of it. In the last three years, you've probably heard more about it than you want to. What I need you to understand is the mortgage market in the United States is about a $10 trillion market. Right? That means there's about somewhere in the neighborhood of 55 million 
people who own homes who have mortgages. The serious delinquency rate on that total mortgage market is running, as I say, about 10%, which means there's about 5 million borrowers out there who are behind on their mortgage payments 90 days or more or in foreclosure. So that's the total market. Freddie Mac, $1.8 trillion of mortgages. So out of the total of $10 trillion, we're about 18%. That's about 12 million borrowers. So there's a few more borrowers if you count it on that basis, a few less if you count it on dollars. That's because the type of mortgages that we guarantee are a little bit smaller than the average mortgage. The seriously delinquency rate on Freddie Mac's portfolio, 3.8%. 10% country at large, 3.8% on Freddie Mac. Total number of serious delinquencies in the Freddie Mac portfolio, somewhere in the neighborhood of 450,000 loans. Five million borrowers in the country, seriously delinquent, about 500,000 in Freddie Mac's portfolio. Or another way of saying it is, what you have is Freddie Mac is financing about a quarter of the market and is responsible for about 10% of the problem. It doesn't quite sound like an institution that should be at the center of having caused the problem. If you think about providing liquidity into the market, over the last two years, We've guaranteed about $750 billion in mortgages, most of those refinances. Those refinances have allowed borrowers to reduce their interest rates such that consumers are saving about $6 billion a year on their mortgages as a result of being able to refinance. So again, I want to come back to the point I made before. Without government support, and that includes support of Freddie Mac, there is no mortgage market. Without a mortgage market, consumers would be $6.5 billion poorer each year because they couldn't refinance their mortgage and get the lower mortgage payment. Put conversely, the benefit of government involvement in the mortgage market and the benefit of government support for Freddie Mac is about six to seven billion dollars of annual cost savings in the pockets of American consumers. The second thing we've been doing in this market is trying to sustain home ownership. And that's really providing modifications for borrowers who are in trouble. Now oftentimes you'll read about the fact that there are again five million borrowers Freddie Mac, we saw you've done 350,000 loan modifications in the last two years. You're not doing enough. How about those other you know, four and a half million borrowers? It's hard to modify loans you don't own. Right? I only can work with the loans that are in my portfolio. I've got 500,000 seriously delinquent loans in my portfolio. That's a stock, but there's a flow in and out of that. So it probably, if you said the total number of borrowers who have been seriously delinquent in my portfolio over the last two years, about 700,000. We've modified 350,000 of those borrowers to put them in a more affordable mortgage product. So half the mortgages, half the serious delinquent mortgages in our portfolio have been modified by Freddie Mac, and the borrower's in a better spot. But I do want to make sure people again recognize that what Freddie Mac can do is provide liquidity to the total market and manage the losses or risks on those loans that are in our portfolio. Most of the statistics that I give you parallel for Fannie Mae Fannie Mae is slightly larger than Freddie Mac, so the absolute numbers are slightly higher, but the proportions are about the same. They control or guarantee a much larger proportion of the mortgage market than their seriously delinquencies represent, which says a big part of the mortgage market is actually in the hands outside of Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, or even FHA, and is in, is in the hands of private investors who have to make their own decisions about how to manage losses and treat borrowers. Now, a lot of folks hear those statements and say, okay, that sounds good. I hear what you're doing in conservatorship, but what would you do before? And the answer is exactly the same thing. Right? Freddie Mac created in 1970, Fannie Mae much earlier, but our job was largely to provide access to and liquidity for the mortgage market. Over time, we did that through kind of providing guarantees on fixed rate 30-year mortgages that are refinanceable when interest rates drop and, in some sense, smoothed out the flow of funds across the country. Prior to Freddie and Fannie, oftentimes you'd have pockets of uh, the country where the savings weren't large enough to fund the mortgages. Freddie and Fannie smoothed that out. The capital markets, the secondary market, smoothed that out. Now, as I said before, the example I gave you where borrowers have been able to refinance over the last two years and have saved $6 billion in annual payments. If you think about that, one of the benefits of Freddie and Fannie, one of the benefits of securitization is those six or seven billion dollars a year, assume those loans are going to be around for five or six years, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 billion dollars. Keep that in mind. Second thing Freddie Mac does is lower interest rates relative to the rates that would be available if we didn't exist. Now again, we do that 
not kind of just on our own merit. We do that because investors historically perceived and were proven right that the government would not allow the investors in Freddie Mac securities, bonds or debt, to fail. As a result of that implicit, subsequently made explicit guarantee, mortgage rates on loans guaranteed by Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae are about 25 basis points lower, a quarter of a point less than you'd get if you didn't have Freddie and Fannie. During the peak of the crisis, it was actually about a point and a half less than you'd get outside of Freddie and Fannie. During the peak of the boom, it was maybe less than that. So if you think about the value of a Freddie or a Fannie, what you have to ask yourself is to say, how much is that 25 basis point worth? You do the math. It's simple as, how many loans do we guarantee? 1.8 trillion. How long have we been doing that? 40 years. Start at zero, go to 1.8, take an average over the 40 years. Take 25 basis points that we save in interest rates and begin to figure what was the value created by having Freddie and Fannie. If you actually do the math, you realize that the value is somewhere in the 50 to $75 billion range. So now you take that 50 to $75 billion, you add the $30 billion I just described from having the access to fixed rate refinanceable mortgages, and you start to say that the country benefited from Freddie Mac to the tune of $100 billion. Take the flip side of it. To date, the Treasury has invested in Freddie Mac $64 billion. Right? That's the amount of negative net worth that we had, and as a result of that, the government's infused $64 billion with the capital. So from a societal perspective right now, you have society, homeowners, over the last 40 or 50 years, benefiting to the tune of $100 billion. Society, taxpayers, costing about $64 billion so far. Net, we're still up. So in many ways, what Freddie Mac has done historically is provide liquidity and sustain home ownership. It's what we're doing during the crisis. The challenge that we now face is, as I said, the mortgage market doesn't exist without government support. And what's happened right now is both the psychology of borrowers and the psychology of investors is dramatically changing. Borrowers now have begun to believe that they do not have a responsibility to repay a mortgage. If houses go down in value, they shouldn't be accountable. When I price mortgage risk every day in the business that I run, I have to make estimates about how many borrowers are going to pay and if they don't pay, what my losses are going to be. I base those views on how the world has worked historically, but the world is changing dramatically. And if those changes become institutionalized, then the price that we'll need to charge for mortgage credit will go up significantly. Likewise, investors. Right? Investors have pretty much said, we're not going to buy mortgages unless backed by the government. You know, on the one hand, I can call out and say, Freddie Mac's work in this time period has been a huge success. But the flip side is also true. Without the Fed, without Treasury, there was no demand for mortgage-backed securities. And so it wasn't just the front end guaranteeing the risk. Someone had to buy the underlying security, and it was the Fed and Treasury. We have to find other investors, and other investors right now are saying, we really don't want that asset. So it'll be useful during the Q&A to go through some of the kind of options that are available, but it's not a pretty picture right now because there's no real support outside the government on the front end for, take, for making mortgages, and there's no real investors on the back end for buying them. On that happy note, <laughs> I'll turn it over to, to Peter. Uh, well, thanks, Don. Uh, I need to go and sell stock. Uh, Dan Laufenberg is an economic consultant, author, editor, and publisher of the Laufenberg Economic Quarterly, and an economist for the investment firm of Stonebridge Capital Advisors. Dan retired in 2009 as the chief economist and vice president of Ameriprise Financial. And prior to that, Dan uh, served for 14 years uh, at the Federal Reserve's Board of Governors on their research staff. He holds an undergraduate degree in business administration and economics from the University of Wisconsin Platteville and a master's degree in economics and a doctorate in economics with a minor in statistics uh, here at Iowa State. I first met Dan, I think, almost my first year uh, here at Iowa State. He had returned to Iowa State to take over Dudley Luckett's monetary classes when Dudley was on leave to uh, study the currency union of the Caribbean. And I have to admit, I was really impressed. Uh, number one, that the Caribbean had a currency union. And number two, that the state of Iowa would pay somebody to go to the Caribbean to study. 
uh, currency union. So I, I've tried to sort of think about how precisely to find a project in the Caribbean that requires a labor economist, and I've been unsuccessful to date. Dan's going to be speaking in Sonia Huffman's uh, class. All of these three are, are, are visiting classes over the, uh, the next, uh, over today and, and tomorrow. And, and Dan's uh, going to be talking to Sonia's um, comparative systems class tomorrow. Uh, the class is at 11 o'clock, and Dan has to be in Minnesota. He's on the Minnesota Council of Economic Advisors at 3. So uh, I, I assume that there's a speed limit there that is compatible with that, but I don't think it's one that's on any of the signs. Uh, Dan's project, discuss the role of large commercial and investment banks in this crisis, the strategies taken by the banks that survived, and whether they would have survived without federal intervention, and how new regulations will affect the strength and performance of the banking industry, or something like that. <laughs> Thanks. Dan Loffenberg. I'm going to follow Don's lead and tell you right up front that it's not even close to what uh, Peter just described. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I will uh, have, take a little liberty here and actually uh, do a little more of a macro view of the crisis, because... Uh, there's a lot of uh, there's going to be a lot of books written. There's a lot of, already a lot of articles that have been written about, and a lot of commentary uh, that you hear on the, the media uh, about what was the cause or causes of the crisis. And I think it's sort of interesting to sort of step back and try to examine some of these things. Uh, I was just reading an article in the uh, in the uh, the uh, St. Louis Fed uh, review, and it was talking about, uh, they listed four related causes, and I just want to mention these to start, and then we're going to say why they're not the causes. Uh, rapid growth and collapse of housing prices, one. Two, general decline in mortgage underwriting standards, increase, uh, increase of subprime mortgages. Three, widespread mismanagement of financial risks by firms. Four, Households and financial institutions become increasingly over-leveraged during the years leading up to the crisis. Now, these are the four related causes, supposedly, of the crisis. I would say that these are symptoms of the crisis. And if you want to look at the cause of the crisis, you have to go back maybe one or two decades. What you've really had is you've had, in my opinion, over the years, you've had a misguided housing policy and you've had an overly accommodative monetary policy that has uh, led to the situation that we, uh, that we experienced in 2007, 2009. In terms of housing policy, I'm not talking about Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, Jenny Mae. Housing policy, I'm talking about just general over, over macro view about owning a house. We have done a lot of things in, the, uh, in policy to try to encourage people to be a, a homeowner. And it makes a lot of sense. Uh, for example, in 1986, we passed a, a, a tax a reform that said that the only uh, interest uh, that you could deduct on your tax form was the mortgage that you paid, the interest you paid on your mortgage. So that, was, that gave it favorable tax treatment to a mortgage. You could borrow money and, have, and, and, and uh, declare the interest as a deduction. Up until that time, all interest was deductible. After uh, 1986, only the, uh, only the interest on a mortgage was deductible uh, going forward. Initially, the uh, restrictions were quite clear. You could only use, uh, you could obviously borrow uh, to buy a house, but then you could also establish other lines of credit that were secured by the house, but you could only use the proceeds to do home improvement or education. And there was limits. I think I don't remember the exact dollar limit, but I think there was a dollar limit how, how much you could do. Over the years, those limitations were relaxed. And so uh, probably because it was difficult to enforce, uh, so what you did is you saw uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, you could do a home equity line of credit and you could use the credit to, do, to buy anything. And so it basically became a, a more attractive alternative to consumer loans for consumers. Why would I borrow money from the bank or the, the finance company to buy uh, something like a car or, or appliance or, or go on a vacation when I can get a home equity line of credit at a lower interest rate than I would pay if I was borrowing from the bank for this other purpose and I can deduct the interest on my tax return. 
a very strong incentive for people to use their house to help finance other things other than housing. So there's a tax advantage. Then in 1996, we also got another little benefit. I mean, there are other benefits, but the one that came along was that you had uh, capital gains on taxes. And capital gains treatment of taxes, it's the most tax advantaged asset you can own. You can get a capital gain of $500,000 on your primary residence every two years, sell that residence, and to pay no tax on that gain of a half a million dollars for a couple, $250,000 for, for an individual. No other asset gets that kind of tax treatment. So what happens? Well, what, when does that particular tax feature have value? It obviously has value when prices are going up. And the more prices go up, the more valuable that particular tax feature is. And so it just sort of feeds on itself and creates the incentive for people to go out and buy a house and, and pay up and, 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 uh, and uh, take, the, uh, take the gain and, and pay no taxes. And what happens over time is that these tax advantages that are in housing eventually show up in the price of the asset. The price of the asset over time will actually reflect the tax advantages that are out there. If you look at Canada, for example, where you have no interest deduction, where you don't have the special treatment of capital gains on housing, the, the cost of housing per square foot in Canada is l more than half of what it is in the U.S. You still have the same percentage of house home ownership in Canada, roughly, that you have in the U.S., but you have the cost being much lower. And I contend that it's this housing policy that's uh, primarily through the tax code that has contributed to this, this, uh, this idea that you can leverage up your house. Now, obviously, you get, go to extremes and you, you have abuse, and that's how you get there, but that's the other part of it, monetary policy. Monetary policy was extremely accommodative. You had a situation where when, as inflation came down, you had two decades of basically disinflation in the U.S. As inflation came down, interest rates followed. As interest rates came down, it became more, uh, it became easier for people to use uh, uh, financing to borrow on their house. Uh, for example, how many times have you gone in and bought a car and the person didn't really ask you, the salesperson didn't ask you, well, how much can you pay for the car? They'd ask you, how much can you afford for a payment per month on the car? And that's basically what it is. As interest rates go down, you can actually pay up. You can buy more house because the monthly payment that you get is going to be less. So it encourages uh, ho uh, home ownership, but it also encourages people to go out and, and really abuse, I think, uh, the, the asset that they have. And it also, I think, contributes to the higher prices. So the fact that prices went up shouldn't have been a surprise to anybody because the prices were, in fact, capturing a combination of these tax benefits and as well as, as, well as some other, other factors. But uh, it was clearly a part of the story. In terms of, uh, in terms of the Fed and what they did, they basically got themselves in a situation where uh, as interest rates came, excuse me, as inflation came down, interest rates followed. And uh, we were basically now in a situation where we were in a probably a, a, a liquidity trap, is what Dudley said earlier, and I think that's probably close. Uh, we really have a hard, difficult time getting out of this situation. Lower interest rates really aren't going to do you much good. Interest rates are zero at the short end. How much lower can they go? Uh, so it's not the uh, lower interest rates that you need, in my opinion. I think it's something else. So it's really the incentives that have been put in place by what I consider an overly accommodative monetary policy and a, uh, a misguided housing policy over the last 20 years that got us into this predicament. And so what it, we need to do is we need, we're not going to get out. There's no magic bullet. There's no way to really get out of this mess that we're in. Uh, it will take time to deleverage. It will take time to correct. But it also, in my view, represents an opportunity for policy to change, to change the incentives that are out there for us in terms of whether or not we, uh, we own a house and what kind of incentives do we have that's going to push us to buy more and more house when you don't need more and more house. You need a place to live. You need a house. So that's I think, is the key here. Uh, and to also manage this. Stuff. And, and so change the incentives. Uh, regulation. We're going to have new, uh, more regulation. 
Uh, I'm not sure exactly what it's going to look like. Uh, I'll be interested to see what it's all going to be, uh, what it's going to be when they're done. Uh, we'll probably hear about that uh, hopefully a little bit. But it seems to me that it's not regulation that's going to get us out of this. You need to change the incentives that are in place so that people stop behaving in, in, these, in this way. Just change, change people's behavior, and you should never, ever use the tax code as an incentive anyhow, in my opinion. You should, what you should do is allow the uh, economic fundamentals to drive the decision uh, and not uh, enact the tax code. So I'll stop there, and we'll continue this later. Well, thank you, Dan. Mm -hmm. Um, our third speaker, Kevin Moore, has since 2009 been vice president in charge of the supervision and risk management division of the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, in which he's responsible for the supervision and regulation of the district's state member banks and bank holding companies, as well as the bank's discount window and risk management functions. Kevin is not an ISU alum, but he's real close to that. Uh, he's a native of Harlan, Iowa, home of the uh, Cyclones, I believe, and uh, a football tradition that we can only uh, hope that we can aspire to, although things look good on Saturday. And uh, he has three nephews currently here uh, at uh, Iowa State, uh, two in engineering and one in, in agribusiness. So uh, 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 we think that we can make him an honorary alum for that, for that purpose. He has a bachelor's degree from Northwest Missouri State and an MBA from Rockhurst University in Kansas City, which is, I think, the Kangaroos or something like that. Uh, that's no oh, well, it's something else then. Uh, <laughs> Cyclone's awfully, awfully good. And then uh, he's also a graduate of the Stone Air uh, Graduate School of uh, Banking. And his assignment was absent the traditional uh, 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 functions available to the Fed for uh, managing interest rate policies. What are the non-traditional actions taken by the Fed during the crisis? What is the legal basis for those actions? And what is the future role of the Fed in regulating the financial system. So, Kevin. Well, thank you very much, Peter. And good evening, everyone. Happy to be here. And as Peter said, I am not an Iowa State alum. Um, but my boss, President Tom Honig from the Federal Reserve Bank of Kansas City, is a graduate of Iowa State University. So. Again, I feel a little bit like I'm empowered to be here. Um, I am replacing our head economist, who's also uh, an Iowa State alum, so very distinguished economics alumni from Iowa State, and that is Alan Barkema. Um, I'm not an economist, so I think I get to say whatever I want. I'm not offended by it all, but what Dan just presented, in fact, Dan set me up very well with some comments I want to make. Um, I'm a bank supervisor. I'm that, uh, that guy on It's a Wonderful Life, the... The nerdy, little, uh, the nerdy little guy who had to call out the bank and possibly close the institution. That's, that's what I did when I started back in 1982. Um, I was an examiner for the Kansas City Fed, and I went through the last crisis being one of those guys who had to go into the banks and tell them they didn't have enough capital to survive, and uh, FDIC was going to come in and close the institution on a Friday night. So having lived through that uh, as, a, as a bank examiner, um, I've since found another role within the Federal Reserve, but it provided me a tremendous perspective coming into this crisis. Um, you could see it coming. It wasn't, hard to, uh, it wasn't hard to pinpoint. We saw past dues increasing rapidly in our banks. We saw what was going on in the uh, Wall Street firms. Uh, we didn't necessarily have all the tools to, to deal with that, and I'll, I'll, I'll comment on that in a minute. Um, but we were, we were fairly well prepared for what was going to happen. Um, at least in our, in our banks. So in, as, as Peter said, I'm responsible for state member banks in the 10th Federal Reserve District. That's seven states. It's about 170 banks, most of which are under 10 billion in size, have nothing to do with what's going on in New York and Wall Street. Um, so in my picture of the world, I could get my hands around what was going on. We had a lot of banks making um, land development loans, construction loans to finance home development in many parts of the Midwest. And 
They were doing very well up until that crisis. I had heard of some prime, hadn't really seen it, didn't know what it looked like, couldn't really define it, um, but kind of heard it was going on. Predatory lending, that was another term we kept hearing. Uh, I had no idea the magnitude uh, of the crisis and what it was going to do. Um, my little piece of the world, the Midwest, I was a great example of a state that is much better shape. You may feel like you're feeling some pain. You have no idea. If you lived in Florida or you were in the California, Washington, D.C. areas where, where housing prices ran up higher, uh, they've fallen a lot farther. So even though unemployment isn't where we want it to be in the Midwest, we are in a much better position than other parts of the country. So when I, when I began to simulate all that and Peter asked me to speak, I thought, all right, what am I going to talk about here? I'm, I'm not an expert in economics. But I, what I am going to do is I'm going to talk about two areas, bank supervision and economics, because the Fed has three primary roles. We're involved in financial services, we're involved in monetary policy, obviously, and we're involved in bank supervision. And it's the combination of those that make our, our responsibilities one of creating a safe, stable, and uh, financial system that you can trust. And I never thought that that trust could be challenged until I went through 2008. And so that's where I'm going to kind of pick up my comments um, to kind of paint the picture and remind everybody of what, what happened uh, during those years because it, it got pretty scary in the middle of the year. Uh, literally people who had uh, deposits well under $100,000 and everyone knows you got FDIC insurance. So if a bank fails, you got $100,000, you're good to go. Uh, the following Monday you can pull your money out. Um, but we literally had people pull, pulling their money out of the bank because they had lost total faith in the financial system. And that goes for Wall Street firms, mutual funds. We had break the buck, if you heard that, happen in 2008. Um, we had the demise of Bear Stearns to start with. We had Lehman Brothers. We had uh, Merrill Lynch get take over by Bank America. We had Wachovia go over to Wells Fargo. I mean, I could go on and on. These are household names that everyone had investments in, and everyone, if you invested in a mutual fund, they invested in these companies and banks. And to see these companies struggle like they did uh, was staggering and really created a lot of uncertainty in the markets, in which case even the banks that were in reasonably good shape found themselves in a severe capital and liquidity crunch throughout that year. So I'm going to comment on four things. I'm going to comment on the policy actions the Fed took to address this, this uncertainty in the markets, and I'm going to compound on, compound on just a, comment on a couple of supervisory steps that were taken, and then I'm going to try to spend a few minutes just on the Dodd-Frank bill um, and give you a few highlights of what to expect going forward in that piece of legislation. So as, as was said earlier by Dan, monetary policy, previous recession uh, after the tech bubble, the Fed aggressively reduced rates to kind of mitigate the, the impact of that recession. Standard procedure for the Fed when, when the economy gets into trouble, we're going to lower rates to try to pick things up so that we can smooth out the roughness in that. Same thing when things get too hot, we're going to raise rates so we can slow down the economy. Because our, our mandate as monetary policy is we want stable prices and we want maximum employment. And there's a balancing act between those two. What happened is coming into this crisis, we already had fairly low rates. When we started to see the problems, we aggressively reduced rates again. Um, rates went down to 0.25 percent in uh, short-term rates went down to 0.25 percent in late 2008 and have stayed that way ever since. So I'll go back to Dan's comment. We kept rates too low for too long and that was part of the environment that contributed to this debacle in the first place. And now we've had 0.25, which is basically a negative interest rate when you factor in inflation. And we've had that for now um, a year and a half, and we're continuing to go in, in the same direction. So uh, whether that's the right policy action, that is the direction we are on. And that wasn't enough. So we've got free money, and it's still not enough to stop uh, what has been just a, a very critical crisis um, that, that we've been dealing with. The other tool the Fed has is we can provide liquidity, and, and we do. And throughout the crisis, as Peter said, we, we introduced some very unconventional things I didn't even know uh, we had the possibility of, uh, of developing. And uh, to, to again, to address this issue, I just want to kind of set the stage. When I mentioned all those failing firms, a lot of these firms are very interconnected. And that's what we found out through the crisis, that many of these institutions we traditionally looked at as as one entity, and if that entity failed, you know, 
shareholders lose their money, we'll get somebody else in and the business will go on. But what we found is companies like AIG, okay, like the, the big investment bank firms, they are interconnected not only with your mutual fund and other companies around the United States, but companies around the world and banks around the world. And so the demise of any one of these institutions, it was unknown how systemically important or how systemic that impact could be on other institutions. And as fragile as our economy was in 2008, Chairman Bernanke, Secretary of Treasury, President of the United States, and a bunch of other very, very smart people decided that wasn't the course we wanted to go and let these institutions individually fail. You know, we can all sit and debate whether that was the right policy action, but if you could just sit back and put yourself in their position, you know, as was said earlier, this, was, this is as bad as the Great Depression. In many cases, it's even worse. You know, do you want that on your watch? So the political pressure to do something was right there, and so the Fed got to work, and they did, they did a number of things. First off, we extended lending uh, maturities on all loans to banks. Normally, we lend overnight to banks, but we lend on 30 days, 60, 90 day terms to banks. We accepted almost any type of collateral they wanted to pledge to us. Normally, we have very high standards for collateral. We never lose money on a loan, still haven't lost any money. But we began to accept mortgage backed securities and some other higher risk instruments as collateral, again, to entice institutions to borrow from the Fed. The other things we did, we introduced what we called a uh, term auction facility. So instead of banks coming to us and paying the rate that, that we want to assess, uh, we allowed them to bid on a rate. And they could bid for the amount of money they wanted to borrow, and as long as the, the rate that they bid on was at an acceptable level, all institutions um, above that amount got money. So it was another way to introduce liquidity into the market through our discount window funding. And then we introduced some really crazy things. We had some uh, what we called lending facilities. The market was dysfunctional. Uh, people weren't playing nice with one another. Banks weren't lending to each other. Uh, firms weren't lending to banks. So credit lines were compromised. And so the Fed stepped in as an intermediate into the market. And I don't have the exact number, but it's in the dozens of, of facilities that we created simply to put ourselves in the place of market participants who had declined or were unable to participate to the way they always had. All in the spirit of we need, a, we need an economy that's running smoothly, we need people to have confidence in the financial system. So while you might read about some of this in the paper, I think for the most part it, it worked because we averted, we averted a, a depression. We did have a severe recession, the longest we've had, 18 months in length, but it could have been worse. Um, all those facilities have been resolved except a couple. We still have money out to AIG and we still have money out to uh, uh, City, I believe. Um, all the other facilities though, have been resolved, no losses to the taxpayer, no loss obviously to the Federal Reserve. So that's the good things. Economy though, we're still, we're still not where we need to be. So then we introduced some easing because we just exhausted the two tools we had available to us. So we started buying securities. We'd already got short-term rates down to zero, so now we're going to focus on long-term rates. And we started buying mortgage-backed securities and treasury securities to the tune of $1.7 trillion. Our balance sheet at the Fed is normally around $900 billion. Right now it's $2.3 trillion. I told a class this afternoon, I said, you know how much a trillion is? I said, if you take a stack of dollar bills, a trillion will get you a third of the way to the moon. So with 2.3 trillion, we can just about touch it. Um, that's a lot of money. And that's what the Fed's balance sheet looks like right now. So what you're entrusting us to do is to be able to pull that money out because it's basically gas being ready to put on a fire. If, if banks turn around, so far banks aren't lending, but if those banks turn around and take, those money, take that money that we pumped into the economy and they start lending, it's going to quickly multiply and we're going to see inflation start to kick in. And unfortunately, a lot of the policy actions or most policy actions that the Fed would introduce, it takes six to nine months for them to take effect. So if we start to see the whites of eyes of inflation, it's going to be too late. And we're going to see a spike in, in pricing that uh, will hurt our economy in the future. So. Um, but we have the tools to pull the money out. It's just a matter of can we do it in the right time, and that's, that's the key element. Okay, so that's, that's the easing. You hear about QE? That's QE right there. We also took supervisory actions, um, and I'll quickly touch on these. One is 
we did a stress test. Biggest banks in the country, about 19, 20 of them. We, we stressed their assets. We stressed their loan portfolios, credit cards, consumer loans, mortgages, whatever they had. We applied stress tests across the board evenly to all those institutions, and we, we assessed, uh, based on a loss scenario, what does that do to their capital positions. The reason we did this, everyone was losing confidence in the largest institutions. If that happened, we were in trouble. So this was a way to identify in a very secretive way because we made everyone do this. We made everyone go through this process so we didn't single out any one bank. And, and then we asked them to, be, to buy an investment in the government, these Treasury uh, Troubled Asset Relief Funds, which was the bailout capital that you've all read about. All those institutions purchased that capital and all of that's been repaid by most of those institutions now. So again, it was a short-term supervisory step that, that we took at the Federal Reserve to get our hands around, if this thing keeps getting worse, how bad could it get? And under that scenario, we asked institutions to go raise capital. Um, the other thing I want to touch about, and then I'll hit on the act, um, is just the, the magnitude of problems. I, I focus most of my comments on the large banks, but unfortunately, we have uh, as many problem banks in this country as we did back in 1982 when we had the last crisis. Uh, as a percentage, we have far fewer banks. We have roughly half the banks we had back in the last crisis, but as a percentage, the problems are more significant. And unfortunately, the problems are in the bigger institutions. So the average asset size of a failed bank today is much greater than it was back in the 80s. So this is, this is every bit as severe a recession and banking uh, crisis as we've had before. And we're working hard to get out of it, but uh, frankly, we've got a ways to go. So. I, I will stop on that section and then just qu quickly comment on the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Financial Protection Act. And, and as long as that name is, uh, that's nothing compared to the length of the legislation. 2,300 plus pages, and if you've ever read a legal document, it is really hard. 2,300 pages is painful. And as I was telling some people earlier, it's not only 2,300 pages but there's so many sections that are very vague. There are very, some sections that are very prescriptive as to what we do as regulators. There are other sections that tell us to go do a study and come back in a year to Congress and explain what, what we found. And then they'll write a rule and set a law. So it's, it's, it's very complicated. We have at the Fed, just the Fed alone, we have 250 projects going simultaneously to implement our portion of the legislation. The FDIC, the control of the currency and other agencies have their own responsibilities. And then there's a number of groups where we're working jointly together. Um, I'm just going to comment on a couple that I think are most important to this audience. One, you, you probably have heard of Too Big to Fail. I, I, I kind of alluded to it with these largest firms. Twenty largest firms in the country now own 80 percent of all banking assets. So any one of those firms is systemically connected, they're systemically important, and, and if they were to fail, it would have repercussions. We did not have a resolution process to deal with those prior to this legislation. So that was a key element of the legislation was to go back and try to figure out how we could do that. Hmm. I'll leave it to you whether they actually did that well enough in the legislation if you've read it. Um, but there is a, a mechanism to put a company into bankruptcy to make the shareholders lose their investment and, and to find a way to resolve that institution through the FDIC who's, a, who's experts at resolving failing banks. Um, we'll see the next crisis. Uh, that'll test whether that process will actually work. Um, the second thing is there's many firms out there that aren't banks. We traditionally look at banks and bank holding companies. That's my job. But we found through this crisis, unfortunately, that companies like AIG, um, they're not banks. They owned a thrift that technically qualified them for access to our discount window, but they weren't banks. And there's firms like that that are systemically important to the United States and our banking and financial system. So if the Fed's going to be responsible for this financial stability thing, we need to have our hands around what's going on in various industries, whether they be banks or not. So this legislation also sets up what they call a Financial Stability Council. It's composed of the heads of the 10 of the largest agencies uh, around banking, insurance, commodities, and somehow this group is going to work together and they're going to oversee financial stability for, for, the, for the country. Again, I, I'm, I'm a little bit skeptical, but uh, I'm, willing to, uh, I'm willing to support this effort. I, it, it, certainly the cause 
and, and, and what they're trying to do is, is important and drives at a key point of, of what we found in the crisis. The effectiveness, though, has yet to be determined, and that, again, will play out um, probably through the next crisis. And the last thing is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. This was a, this was a takeaway from the Fed. Uh, we took all the heat for uh, not protecting consumers throughout the, the crisis. Um, I'm not going to hear it you know, play either side of that argument, but this new bureau is being put in place. They will take care of all rule writing. The best thing about the bureau is their responsibilities extend beyond banking. So while the Fed wrote rules and we enforce those rules in the confines of the banking industry, this group can go to mortgage companies, they can go to payday lenders, they can go to pawn shops, they can go to secondary car dealers. They can, they can reach out a lot further than the Fed could ever done. Whether they will or how they do that has yet to be determined. This is a, this is a, a regulatory body that has no employees. They don't have a director yet because there's issues about whether she could actually be do, uh, uh, elected to the post. They can't write any rules until they have that. Um, they don't have any problem with funding. The Fed's taking care of that for them. We're, we're paying the bill for this the new agency. But they don't have any staff. So it's, again, it's work in progress. They've got to have this thing up and running by July of next year. So another daunting challenge for another group of, uh, of regulators. So that's something to look out for because as they write rules, they will be writing rules that may cause your bank to have to, you know, take away charging you fees for one thing. Um, they'll, 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 they'll moderate fees in other areas, but banks are in the business of making money. And if they're not allowed to charge you a, a certain overdraft fee, guarantee over time they're going to find a way to make up that fee in other areas. So ultimately, the cost that, that they impose on the banks will be transferred to all of us in the services that we, that we receive from institutions. So uh, it's unfortunate we went through a crisis. We're not through the rest of it yet. Uh, it's going to be costly to recover. But like the last crisis, there are lessons to be learned, and we are in the process of learning them in a very painful way. So, Peter, I'll stop right there. Well, thank you. <laughs> We're going to ask the panel to come up front now. and. Um, what we're going to do is um, uh, spend uh, um, uh, 20, 30 minutes, I think, on questions. I think uh, just raise your hand. I'll recognize you. Yell it out, and I'll try to repeat the question, and then uh, we'll let the, um, uh, let the panel uh, have at it. So questions? Yes. Why do bank transactions like credit default swaps have to be secret. Why should a hedge fund be able to buy insurance on 20 billion worth of housing market CDOs and not reveal to anybody that that contract exists? So the question is, why would things like credit default swaps uh, be secret, so not publicly uh, announced? And I think step one, uh, define a credit default swap. And step two, uh, explain why they might be secret under the current system. And, and is there a way of bringing these into the same type of transactions that we would have, say, on a uh, on, uh, uh, stock market? Go ahead. No. All right. <laughs> I'm not sure I have a good answer for that. Uh, yeah, I, I actually don't have an answer for that one. Well, first of all, uh, credit default swaps basically is a form of insurance that really was never reserved as insurance. Uh, AIG got in trouble because they offered this particular product uh, with the, uh, well, I think with the, with the assumption that uh, the value of a house would never, <laughs> would never go down. Uh, mortgages, uh, they, they basically were unrealistic, I think, in terms of uh, how bad it could get, uh, and they priced uh, the insurance accordingly. Uh, but a credit default swap is basically a form of insurance uh, betting uh, uh, or insuring against a, a default on a particular credit, uh, but it really wasn't treated as an insurance product. There was no reserves that were set up, so it was... Um, it wasn't really under the guidelines of insurance uh, insurance uh, regulation. But Dan, uh, in but terms but of why it was, uh, but just one clarification: wasn't the 
the counterparties in the credit default swap, though, would post collateral back and forth relative to their kind of mark-to-market -market position, right? Right. There would be some. There would be some collateral, but uh, yes. Uh, but may not have held enough collateral against that right. position given the, mac the right. big moves. Right. Okay. Uh, in terms of, uh, I, I, I don't. Aren't they? Aren't they traded on exchanges now? They're going to be. They're going to be. <coughs> they move in there. Well, that section of the legislation will will require that those have more transparency around the transaction to address the very concern you raised. You have a confidence that I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's just what the legislation intends. But, but it seems as though from your question, if you could just go a little bit further, there's an underlying premise there. So how do you think the disclosure of that would have somehow either, I guess, prevented the crisis or helped the situation? Well, if it were publicly known, the government could do something about it. But as long as they're secret, even the companies that are writing them don't know what's mm -hmm. going on. And so it's this enormous mountain of ignorance that's kind of a problem. Okay. No. <laughs> Is there any idea as to how large uh, the liabilities AIG was holding, uh, say, two years ago about this time? When is, Has anybody actually been able to figure out how much they were potentially um, liable for in terms of the, uh, the insurance? I mean, it, it was. It, I mean, obviously, it was much larger than the firm itself. I don't have the. I don't have the numbers. I, I wish. I wish I'd have known that in advance. I could have gotten those numbers. We, the Fed in New York, actually went in and and, and ran AIG after it went into the ground, and we had to lend the money. We we took over AIG, not in an operational sense, but we were at every key decision. We were on the board. We were in there every single day. Uh, to try to understand their business and to try to get them in a position where they could sell the assets to pay, pay the Fed back. So, I have access to people who would have that answer, but I don't. I don't have that intelligence today. But it would probably get you to the moon if you stacked it up as it's, single it's, dollars. It's a big number. They, as Dan said, they never expected to pay a dime. So they issued these credit default swaps like it was candy. And unfortunately, if they'd have factored in real liabilities, they would have never done that. Their parent company didn't even know what they were doing. So it was a disaster. Go ahead. Um, my question is more for Fred than that. But uh, you mentioned in the beginning of your speech when the mortgage becomes more than what the current clause hold is worth, and people who haven't lost their jobs, uh, the option of refinancing is not possible. And you actually start to so the question is if you're um, I, well I'm not sure what the the question is is it how big a problem that is then okay so the issue is if you know, how large is the problem of mortgages that are underwater which uh, with, with people doing what are called strategic defaults where they can actually pay the mortgage, uh, but they decide to walk away from the property. So there are a couple of, of questions actually in there. One is the issue of strategic defaults. Two is the question about borrowers who are underwater who can't refinance. There actually are programs in the marketplace right now that allow borrowers that are underwater to refinance. So again, Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae both have programs that allow borrowers who are actually underwater on their mortgages up to 125% loan to value, so 25% over, can refinance today even though they're underwater. Now, the challenge you have, as I said before, Freddie and Fannie control somewhere in the neighborhood of 40 to 50% of the market, so for those borrowers, there's an outlet. For borrowers not in a Freddie Mac or Fannie Mae security, there isn't the outlet, and that creates some of the issues that you raise. Likewise, those programs don't go beyond 125%, so if you're in California or Las Vegas, Florida, you potentially are going to be underwater by a lot more than that 125 percent. The issue of strategic defaulters, I think, is a, is a growing concern. Part of it comes from the, the issue of, you know, one in five being underwater. So if you think about a $10 trillion market, that says there's $200 billion worth of mortgages outstanding where the underlying collateral value is less. If it's less by 10 percent, maybe not a big deal. If it's less by 20 or 30, a big deal. So a challenge, that, <clears throat> excuse me, a challenge that we've been trying to, to look at is what incentives or at least 
negative incentives can we put in place to try to discourage that? It's historically existed, right? You default on your mortgage, you get bad credit. It influences the cost of credit for future purchases. But in the short run, <clears throat> what I think you see is a lot of consumers saying, how far I'm underwater is well in excess of whatever that consequence is, and it's just not enough. Dan or Kevin, anything else? I would, I would agree. I, I, I think it's a real problem because those people who, who pursue that strategic default, uh, for, for every one of those, there's a guy sitting across the street in the same situation, um, but he stands up and pays his mortgage month after month after month. Um, same thing when, when they're not in that position and, and they can't. There's people that are doing everything they can to, to stay in their house, to keep their loan current, and there's other people that walk away much more easily because they're not afraid of what's going to happen either in bankruptcy or they're not afraid of their credit being tarnished. Uh, maybe they choose not to buy a house in the future. <coughs> but I, I think given the magnitude of what Don has talked about, um, it's, it's, it's a potential huge issue for our country going forward. Yeah, actually, let me correct one thing. I said 10 trillion, 20% of what I said 200, but it's 2 trillion. Right, so two trillion dollars worth of mortgages out there, or another way of thinking about it, it's probably around a, uh, a couple million uh, borrowers are sitting out there. So it's, it's a big deal. And one part of the question was, well, what would be the impact on the economy? And it's more of a local economy since real estate tends to be a local market. But if it's going on everywhere, then it's everywhere. And that is that if uh, the guy that walks away from his uh, house uh, because he doesn't want to pay the mortgage anymore, and the guy across the street decides to stay and pay his mortgage, and he's in the same situation, uh, the guy across the street probably is going to see the value of his house go down even more because now you've got foreclosures in the neighborhood. Uh, so it's, that's, that's the adverse effect that it has when people walk away from, from that obligation. I actually wrote a, a short piece on this uh, on, our, on our website here a few months ago, and it was amazing to me the kind of public response to that. And so the initial response to it came largely from the, uh, uh, from the trade media and they, they got the points that were being made and, and characterized as an issue. It then got picked up by lots of bloggers, and the kind of negative sentiment about suggesting that borrowers who are underwater should somehow be held accountable for making good on their mortgage if they had the capacity to make good on it just amazed me. Uh, it, uh, it gave me some insights into both the level of pain I think consumers are experiencing and the level of frustration that consumers are, are having in the market as a whole. Uh, this is a question which um, I'm going to try to shorten it a little bit, but I think I can do pretty well. We have an independent uh, national bank with the Federal Reserve and, and, and quasi-independent uh, housing authorities with uh, Freddie and Fannie. Would the crisis have been avoided had those been uh, fully public uh, <coughs> institutions? No. Uh, one of the ways I think about that one, and I actually think it's a useful, useful way to frame the issue, is you have a fully government program. It's called FHA. Now, FHA got very small during the, the 2000s. It historically was somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to 15 percent of the total market. During the mid-2000s, it shrunk to being less than 3 percent of the market, and currently it's about 35 percent of the market. So it was you know, 10 to 15, got real small, then got big. If you look at FHA's book right now, it's about, and I won't get this number quite right, but it's probably about half the size of Freddie Mac. And yet the total number of delinquent loans in the FHA book are almost one and a half times that of Freddie Mac. So a fully government entity actually has significantly worse performance than the hybrid model of the GSE. So I think having you know, fully public doesn't solve the problem either partly probably to Dan's points in, in his comments, is because fully public, uh, fully public companies are subject to tremendous political influence. <laughs> Let me speak. I'll just add a couple comments from the Fed's perspective. We are, we are a quasi-public uh, outfit. We have a board of governors in Washington, D.C. that's elected through the president, and we have 12 regional Federal Reserve Bank presidents that are voted on by local bankers, local business people. Uh, so we have both a uh, private presence in the region of the United States, but we also have a public presence in Washington. And it's, it was designed by Congress 100 years ago, and the eyes, uh, the previous central banks of the United States failed. We had two of them. They both failed because of undue political influence. 
This third one has lasted a lot longer, and it's both. It's why, if you read the dialogue with the presidents, uh, my president happens to be in a minority, but he is a voting member of the FOMC, and that dialogue, even though uh, he will publicly take a position contrary to the chairman of the Federal Reserve, he's not chastised for it. In fact, he's commended for it in discussions because it's, it's about bringing together views from different parts of the country, public and private, uh, to make the best decisions in the best interest of the country. So from a monetary policy standpoint, you don't want, you don't want the Federal Reserve to be politicized. That would be a disaster. Every four years we get a new president, you're going to get a new monetary policy approach if that would happen. You want the Fed to be independent and to make decisions that are in the best interest of the economy of the United States, not whether it's what President Obama or President um, whoever else that we have in the future. So from, from a political standpoint, you want monetary policy to be independent. From a supervisory standpoint, in my job, there are two other agencies that do the same thing I do. The FDIC and the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, which is a division of the Treasury. They are public. They are part of the government. And they supervise the same banks that I supervise. And they have more problems than I do. So <coughs> I, I don't think public-private is, is, is necessarily the issue. We need to have better regulation and better enforcement of that regulation from a supervisory standpoint going forward. And, uh, and I think that's the, that's the solution. Uh, real quickly, I'm the acronym police. FHA is the uh, Federal Housing Administration. The Federal Housing Administration, and FOMC is Federal Open Market Committee. There you go. Go ahead. More and more consumers appear to be challenging legal documentation of bank ownership of their loans. How pervasive is this so-called foreclosure gate? And is it a systemic problem? Why did government try to pass a law to Uh, the question is, with uh, respect to the recent uh, proposed moratorium on foreclosures due to uh, inadequate documentation of um, uh, loans that are in default, uh, I guess what um, uh, I'll probably won't do this quite properly, but number one, how did that happen? And number two, what are we going to do about it? <laughs> All right, I guess I get this one, huh? I was more concerned about the basic issue. Oh, and how large a problem is it? And I think for the last one, I mean, they're trying to figure that out right now. I, <laughs> there are, it is very per, per, pervasive in certain institutions, and unfortunately these are very large institutions that originated a lot of, of loans that are in this situation. I think it's appalling and embarrassing. Um, there's no excuse for the institutions, and really... Uh, from a supervisory standpoint, um, I don't want to speak for the agencies that actually examine those institutions, but every little individual consumer loan can't be looked at. But the bank, when they originate that loan, they need to make sure their documents are in place. I, my, my examiners, when they go into a, a small community bank, and they don't go into Iowa, but we go into Missouri, Nebraska, wherever, that's one of the key things we look <coughs> at is making sure all the legal documentation is there. So if in case which happens more often than not these days, the bank has to take action against the borrower. They do have the ability to foreclose, okay? We can rely on the collateral they say they have so that we know exactly whether the bank has any loss in those credits. In this case, in many cases, the bank did not finish the documentation record on these consumers, and now they're foreclosing, assuming they had it all, and they're finding out from some attorneys they didn't. So they've got um, a mountain of work to do. We are, this is a very very current issue, and, and I believe all the agencies, OCC, FDIC, the Federal Reserve, and everybody else is trying to get to the bottom of it and trying to understand just how per pervasive it is across a, a broader industry. But for the, for the institutions that I'm familiar with, the largest banks in the country, the ones that are big mortgage um, originators, it's a huge issue. I think you also want to separate the issue into to at least two, if not maybe more than two, uh, components. One component, which by the first one you were getting to, was uh, the issue that was characterized by the final affidavit needing to be provided in a foreclosure case, where the uh, affidavit needs to be signed and to be notarized. And what we discovered in some institutions was that process wasn't being completed uh, in a way that showed integrity. There's a separate issue, and it's really the one probably Kevin's speaking more broadly to, and that is the challenge with ensuring that you, know, you have legal title 
to in substance the note and a legal claim to actually execute that foreclosure. That's the one I think we're still getting to. The first one, while an issue, you need to have integrity in the process, is probably not as as uh, alarming or as challenging as I think the second one could be. Yes. So real briefly, if Ma Bell can turn into a bunch of baby <laughs> bells, can AIG turn into a bunch of uh, baby IGs? Yeah. <laughs> That's an excellent point. Um, I'll answer it somewhat in reverse. Um, the legislation is not going to, to get at that point. Prior to the legislation being written, there was serious debate about that option of breaking up the largest institutions. In other words, is the problem that they're so big that we just don't know what to do with it? Um, because a normal bank closure, if you're going to close a bank on a Friday, the process with the FDIC, big bank acquires small bank, and it's a very seamless transaction, painful for the shareholders of the failing bank, but from the customer standpoint, it's a smooth transition. When you get a bank as big as Citigroup, Bank America, Wells Fargo, whatever, there is nobody who can take those over. because. We just talked about these institutions and how, how uh, big of a concentration they represent. We can't afford to let one of them acquire one of their peers. So, so there was serious talk about, uh, about breaking them up. In fact, my president was one of the strongest proponents of that for the very reason you described. They are much more manageable and we can deal with them. In the legislation, I didn't mention it, but they have these things called living wills that are going to be required, which is all these big institutions are going to be required to lay out a document that spells out their organizational structure and if they get into trouble and need to be resolved this is the plan of how they would be resolved now each firm is developing their own plan it's like writing your own uh, death sentence of how you're going to how you're going to be broken up and and so they will be required to to demonstrate that and it, when we see these documents i have no idea what they look like because they haven't been developed yet but I can't imagine how big and extensive they will be because these companies have thousands and thousands of corporate entities in their organization structure. So the, the concept of breaking them up is, is just astronomical. So um, it's a huge challenge. It's not addressed in the legislation, but it's, it's an excellent point, and it was a view shared by a number of people. It just politically, the, the big banks in the country are, are very, very well positioned, and it just wasn't going to happen. I think we'll do one more question since part of this also is to give people a chance to meet uh, the panelists afterwards. So uh, you'll have the last question. <coughs> So I guess there's there, uh, two questions. One is, uh, perhaps this is for Kevin, uh, 
uh, what is going to be the future regulatory position, perhaps, of the um, uh, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau that uh, Elizabeth Warren is now, uh, I guess, just uh, starting up? What is the future regulatory process for these uh, non-bank banking institutions that are in the business of, of making loans, whether it's uh, payday loans uh, or uh, pawn shops, things of that nature. And just a second issue, um, for something like subprime loans, is there a role for subprime loans or should they be outlawed? How's that? <laughs> okay? Okay, well, um, the, the Bureau will be taking this, this responsibility on in the future in their rule writing. <laughs> So I can, I can remember back in 2007 and 2008, um, we knew subprime lending when we saw it, but we couldn't really well define it. Um, you, know the, you know the circumstances of it. It was, it, was, it was something that institutions began focusing on, and while it happened in a big way outside of the banking industry, big banks also had subsidiaries that <coughs> focused solely on, on this troubled borrower, getting them into a home, and all the things that we've talked about with, right. with the subprime market. So it was a huge profit for them for a while, and it is an issue, and I believe the Bureau will, will attempt to address that through enhanced disclosures, notice to borrowers, and, and making the borrower acknowledge that they understand the terms of their loans much more than ever happened back in, in the mid-2000s. So I think, I think that will happen. Um, with with Elizabeth Warren or whoever runs the bureau, I think that'll be one one of their priorities on day one. Um, what was the second part of the question? Um, I guess uh, is there a role for some of these oh, yeah. novel uh, uh -huh. yeah. loans, subprime loans, alt A loans, things of that nature? Okay, so there throughout the legislation, when they were talking about the bureau and aspects of the legislation, one of the one of the the key issues was maybe we should just have some plain vanilla products no one can offer, you know, for example, we'll say adjustable rate mortgages. Everyone's got to have a 30-year mortgage. Um, I don't think that's the direction we should be going. Um, I think we need an education process, but I'm, I would fashion myself a fairly sophisticated investor, and if I want to get a five-year bullet loan, I know what it means at, at the end of five years. I either need to be able to refinance or pay my loan. A lot of people didn't know that, didn't understand it, should have never been in those products when we went into this crisis. Adjustable rate mortgages, reverse mortgages, there are a lot of products. They are bad in the hands of the wrong people, okay? But, but banks will have a responsibility, and if Elizabeth Warren and the, and the Bureau does their job, the non-banks will be operating under the same level playing field that banks do. It's an education process, but I think consumers deserve a choice. and and. Um, I, I, it's a difficult issue, but uh, I don't think it's fair to people who, who want advantages and to be able to pick and choose the products they want uh, to have to go down to the lowest common denominator. So I, I understand the educational <coughs> challenges, and I applaud people who are in the business of educating consumers, but, but I'm also a fan of, uh, of providing diverse lending products so people can pick and choose what makes most sense for their situation. Okay, let me just a couple things to that. We met over the years with, with many organizations, much like yours. I don't know if we met with your organization, but Freddie Mac's met with many uh, consumer counseling groups, housing advocacy groups, to talk about these very types of issues. Part of the discussion that we would have is help us understand kind of what level of, of risk, what level of, kind of possible default among the group that you're serving is acceptable to you. And it's a very hard question because the first answer usually is, well, we don't want any defaults. The answer is, I agree, that would be great. But if we're going to extend mortgage credit, there's a risk that someone's not going to be able to pay it back. I think what we saw, and it goes a little bit to Dan's points about housing policy, I think what we saw over the last decade or so was <clears throat> a belief that we could continue to expand housing credit to more and more consumers and that the level of defaults was not going to go kind of simultaneously rise. We realized after the fact that wasn't the case. So I think it does go back to... You know, first off, we have to decide what housing policy should be, and then within that housing policy, are we willing to live with the consequences of those choices? That includes both products, that includes both kind of availability of alternative terms, I think. 
Well, thank you for, for coming. I want to give a, a big round of applause to our guests. Um, we do have a, a chance for some, uh, some things to drink and eat over on the side, so you get a chance to meet the panelists if you would. And uh, you guys are teaching again tomorrow morning, so I know we want to get them home and in bed before midnight. So, but thank you so much for coming. Thanks. 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 For coming. Thanks.